Today we're going to be looking at how to hear the voice of God. Um, is, this, is that too loud for everybody or is that... Okay, so maybe just turn it down just a little bit because I'm probably only going to talk a little louder than that. <laughs> so, all right. Is that good? Everybody not blasting anybody out of seats? Okay. That was a very beautiful song too, by the way. Thank you for, for that special music. That was very beautiful. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to hear the voice of God. And actually this is going to expand into uh, a four-part series, but we'll, or probably longer, uh, but we're actually going to use this for our Friday night Bible study. So today you get a little bit of a sneak peek into what we're going to be studying. But how many people have wondered, how can you hear God speaking to you? All right, like this is a really serious question. It's one that I ask frequently so I can make sure that I'm always tuning into God's voice. Today we're going to look at level one of God speaking, speaking to you. And not level one as in it's the most immature way, but it's one way that is probably at the very foundation of how we understand that God is speaking to us. And so I wanted to share with you a quick story. Uh, by the way, when you see this, what do your instincts tell you to do if you saw this? Right. No one has to explain to you that it's a good idea to get away from something that looks like this. But sometimes we forget that God is actually interested in giving us messages like, that guy's not your friend. <laughs> and it's only in amongst human beings where we get confused about what's threatening and what isn't. Animals seem to know. They're never like, oh, is this a friendly lion? No, no, it isn't. You are food all the time, 24-7. In fact, I think it was uh, Siegfried and Roy, the ones that had the tiger, like their Bengal tiger that they had for many years and had trained for many years. They just had one sloppy moment where one of them turned his back on the tiger, which every time you turn your back to a tiger, their instincts kick in to attack. And he totally just forgot that for a minute and turned his back and the tiger attacked. Like tigers are just, they're, they're predators. They're really beautiful predators, but man, that means business. So how do you know when God is speaking to you? Well, one of the things I want to share right up front is that I believe God is constantly impressing us even through the level of instinct, your intuitions. Because God is, there are times where God asks us to walk into fiery situations. There are times where God will ask you to move against your instincts. But unless you are on some mission from God, if you see a tiger, he's not your friend. Everybody follow that? Yeah. Unless you are called by God to do something, you should understand that that is not a friendly situation. So the night before this story uh, that I'm about to share with you happened, my wife uh, was praying for me, which is probably a good idea because I do a lot of silly things. And so she was praying for me. And in the morning, she woke up and just had a dream that just kind of left her with an unsettled feeling. Now, fast forward to what was happening for me. I usually get up early in the morning and I try to go and exercise before I get my day started. I actually really enjoy exercising. And the reason I put these pictures up here is because some people may not know what all these exercises are. I don't think they're Anyway, so one of them is a deadlift. That's what that guy is doing in that, uh, in that picture down there at the bottom. It's just exactly what it sounds like. You have dead weight and you lift it up. That's really all it is, really simple lift. Uh, but for some reason, I, I position a bench just like how that one is positioned, and that helps me when I'm, when I'm lifting with my legs because if I'm doing squats, like with the bar on my back, I want to make sure that I'm coming down low enough to where um, I can feel something bump me that says, hey, you've, you've squatted far enough. And that's usually right where that gray headrest is. I try to get within six inches of the ground because it helps with, uh, with flexibility and all these things. Free tips for anybody that likes exercise. It's a way to do it. Anyway, so I, but for whatever reason that particular morning, I was very concerned about which way I put the bench, which I usually am not. But I was like, huh, I should really put it right here. And so I went ahead and left it there, did my exercises. The last thing I do is deadlift because it requires the least amount of skill. And so I was just like, hey, I'll just do that one last, and then I'll just do as much as I possibly can just so I know that I've got a really good workout. I did that, and after I stood up, you know, I was you know, feeling like I was on top of the world, and I was like, yes, did it. And then the next thing I remember, I was standing like this, and I was like, all right, cool. And the next thing I remember, I'm like falling through the air, and I have no idea why, and then I'm just thinking, oh, maybe I want to take a nap. And then I was like, oh, this bench feels fantastic. And then I hear, doo -doo, like, you know, it sounds like somebody dropped the medicine ball on the bench. Like, it just sounded this huge thud that just hit the bench. And that thud was my face that just went straight into the bench. Now, if you notice which way that bench is positioned, it's positioned at an incline. So instead of me just, like, you know, wrapping it and falling off, it actually caught me, like, in a laying down position. And it was about the softest thing I could have landed on, because once I landed, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm here because I just wanted to lay down. And then it like, I was like, wait, why would you want to lay down? Like, you're, you have to go to work, you're done, like, what are you doing? And it took me a while to realize that what just happened is I blacked out, and I fell over. And instead of hitting the concrete, which was more than glad to accept my face, the bench caught me instead, because it was carefully positioned, because somebody prayed, and somebody else kind of listened to what God said, which is move that thing right about here, and I got a nice soft landing. God talks to us constantly, 
And he speaks to us through many different levels. And today we're going to talk about the level of instinct. So before we do that, we're going to have a word of prayer. And I just want to give a little bit of forewarning. As I share some of these stories, some of them can be a little bit challenging. I try to make sure that I adjust details based on audience. Uh, but I do want to let you know that even though some of these stories have some parts to it that are somewhat difficult, the people make it in the end. So I want to be clear about that piece. But that is my fair warning. I'm not trying to um, bring anybody back to any horrible events. But there is some stories in here that, that talk about how people were saved from terrible scenarios. So with that being said, happy Sabbath to everyone. And let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us here. For every person here may have felt an impression to come today. And Lord, I know that I am here talking about these things because I felt an impression as well. But Lord, we don't want to just follow unguided impressions. We want the impressions to come from your Holy Spirit. And so I pray that your spirit would be our teacher today. Help me to speak only the words that will be a blessing to your people. And take away those words, Lord, which will, un which will be unnecessary. But let every one of us know that we have heard your voice today. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in that story with Samuel, one of the things it says is that he did not know the voice of the Lord. He had not known the voice of the Lord, and that's why he kept getting up. So even Samuel, who is this really good kid who obviously believed in God, he was, you know, like a little mini priest. He was walking around in his little priest coat and all this stuff. I mean, this kid was a godly kid, but when God spoke to him, he didn't know his voice. And so what I want to tell you, even before I tell you any of these stories, is that if you have ever fallen on the wrong side of these things, or if you've even been a victim of some of these things, that is not your fault. There is a reason why we are all born into this world not knowing God's voice, and there is something that broke that bond in the first place. So it is not your fault. And if you are here, you at least did something that allowed you to survive. So Gavin De Becker, he is... He was born in uh, October 26, 1954. He's still alive. He's an American author and security specialist, uh, primarily for governments and large corporations and public figures. He's the chairman of Gavin DeBecker Associates, which he founded in 1978. His entire life has been focused around predicting, preventing, and stopping people from, uh, from, from crimes, and usually pretty awful ones because most people who, if you're a celebrity, you probably will have somebody who stalks you or somebody who does something uh, or, or tries to threaten you. This is just the life of being a public figure. And so his job is to be able to predict these behaviors before they happen. And in his book, he talks about how all of us actually have the ability to predict danger before it happens. So when I asked all of you when you saw that picture of a tiger, no one thought, oh, I want to go pet him. I hope you didn't. Uh, that's not the right answer. Um, but everybody has that instinct that says, hey, something about this is not quite right. So I want to share with you Kelly's story. So Kelly was a young woman who lived in an apartment complex, and it was one of those apartment complexes where you had to enter in through a gate before you can get to the stairs to the apartment complex. So it was, it was, a, um, it was, a, locked, um, it was a locking gate apartment, so usually you'd have to get buzzed in. When she came, she went grocery shopping, and it was at nighttime, and she wanted to carry her groceries in, and she took more groceries than she should have. And she knew it was a lot of groceries, and it was very heavy, but she was just going to try it. And she went up to the, the door, she saw that it was unlatched, she thought, ah, neighbors left it open again. But this time, she was actually grateful that it was open because her hands were full. And so she goes in, and she makes sure to close the latch tight. She waits to hear it click, and is like, okay, perfect, it's closed. And so now she begins her ascent up the four stories, the four flights of stairs. And as she goes up the stairs, the thing that you all want to happen happens. One of the bags rips, and it's never at the top. Right? Like that'd be just, you know, that would be a little bit annoying. It's always at the bottom. And then all of the small things that like to roll are the things that fall out, too. Isn't that lovely when that happens? And so cans of cat food begin to make their way down the stairs, and they start, begin to tumble down. And she watches as one of them tumbles down to the third floor, seems to almost pause, turn the corner, roll, and then continue its ascent down the next steps. And it's like, whew. <laughs> but as she's there, she hears a voice that says, got it. And for whatever reason, she did not like that voice. And so she's like, hmm, I don't think I like that. She didn't know why, but she didn't like it. So then she sees this young man, very friendly looking young man who comes bounding up the stairs, like, hey, I got this for you. And he's like, he's like hey, so you have all these bags. That looks really heavy. Can I get one of these for you? And she's like, she's like no. He's like, well, where are you heading? Um, and then she kind of pauses. And she says, uh, up to the fourth floor. He's like, oh, that's exactly where I'm going. And I'm actually running late. My watch is broken, and I just couldn't tell what time it was. But here, why don't you let me help you with your bags? And she's like, no, I got it. And he insists. He's like, no, no, go ahead. Let me just take your bags. You know, there's such a thing as being too proud, you know. And she's like, uh, hesitates. And then she gives him the bag. 
And from there, in a way, she gives him control. So they go upstairs, and he helps her with the bags to get to the apartment. He says, all right, thanks. Thanks for helping me up this far. That's great. He's like, oh, no, there's no way I'm going to let you carry the rest of the way from here. We got it this far. Let's go ahead and just, uh, we'll set it down. Look, if you're nervous, you could just go ahead and leave the door open. We'll just kind of do like how the old grandmas do. You just leave the door open. I'll go ahead and set it down, and I'll be right out. I promise. So that led to a three-hour crime and a man not keeping his promise. And after that crime was ending, the person who brandished a weapon had told them, you stay here and don't move. And she's like, well, you know I'm not going to do anything. You know I'm not going to move. And so he gets up, he closes the window, and he begins to walk out. And something hit her immediately that said, follow him. She gets up, does not think anything, pulls all the sheets and blankets with her, and just like begins to follow him like a ghost. Does not take a breath, and is standing so close behind him, if she would have breathed, he would have felt it on his neck. She's like right behind him. And as he begins walking toward the kitchen, he pauses for a second, looks to the left, hears that the radio's on, turns up the volume, she's still back here, turns up the volume, and then makes his way over to the kitchen. And as soon as he turns this way, she runs out the door and opens it, does not close the door, runs straight to her neighbor's uh, door, just knew instinctively that that door was going to be open, went in there, locked the door, told them to be quiet, and she is alive. And she shouldn't be, because that's not how that story was supposed to end. Now, when she talks about it, she said that it was like being possessed, like something just took over and she just went, and like her legs were moving before she had a chance to think about it. She went through the entire motion, no thoughts whatsoever, and landed exactly where she was supposed to, and had no idea why she knew the door was going to be open when she walked over there. Now, if you all heard that story, you heard at least four different opportunities to never let it get that far in the first place. But I am thankful that God does not give up just because we didn't listen the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth time. But when it counted the most, the voice was the most loud and distinct, and she is alive because of it. God talks to us all the time. The problem is, is that we don't always hear. So we're going to look at four quick points. One is corrupted instincts or intuitions. What is it that has our instincts or intuitions backwired so that we don't listen to those impressions when they come? The second one is going to be discerning those impressions. The third one is going to be looking at the difference between fear and anxiety because God does not want us to live in fear, but God does want us to have good sense. In fact, the big difference between anxiety and fear, I'm just going to tell you this right up front, is that anxiety are things that you worry about that could happen, and fear is something you know will happen. And most of the time, the things you know will happen, that's the time that you want to act. Like if a car comes swerving in front of you, that's fear. You don't have to wonder whether or not you should hit the brakes. You follow that? That's fear. Anxiety is you're at home and you're not sure if you're going to hit a truck. It's like we're not even in the car yet. That's not what we're talking about. But we should be able to hear the voice of God when it is present. All right, is everybody still with me? All right. So... Intuition, everybody's heard that word before. That word intuition, actually uh, the roots of the word there are the word insight, something that's a direct, immediate cognition or a spiritual perception, which I did not know about that piece until I went and looked it up. It actually was originally a theological term to have intuition, was a theological term. And if you look down there in the part that's highlighted in blue, it's a combination of two words. One is to look and consider, and the other one is to watch over. And intuitions are that which internally watch over you. All right. So the gift of fear. So what is it that corrupted it? When and where did instincts get corrupted? Well, you all can guess it's from the beginning. The problem starts from the beginning. It says, and when they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife did what? hid themselves in the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. This is the beginning of why we can't trust our intuitions. Because instead of allowing God to watch over us, we start watching out for God. God becomes the enemy. And if you believe that God is the enemy, what are the chances that you're going to follow his instructions? Is that clear? Like, once you begin to believe that God is the enemy, now you know why we don't listen. And it's because we've not learned that God is our friend. 
And so we don't trust that intuition. We try to rationalize. We try to say, oh, well, the guy looks friendly, or that woman wouldn't lie to me, or all these other things, and we don't just listen to God. God is actually there to watch out for us. But the instincts became corrupted when we saw God as our enemy. The second piece here is that we began to esteem the safety of our bodies over the safety of our souls. So, in the beginning, here it is that Eve is tempted to take the fruit from the tree of the garden uh, from the knowledge of good and evil because she saw that it would be good for her body. But she took no thought for her soul. And so it is, this is part of the reason why our instincts can cause us to become selfish. It's why during wartime people will betray their neighbors and friends and do all kinds of things because the only thing they're thinking about are their bodies. They are not thinking about their souls. You know the difference, don't you? Like, without me even explaining that, you know the difference between looking out what is good for your soul's salvation and looking out for what is just only in your body's best interest. So what corrupted the instincts was the preservation of body over the preservation of soul, seeing God as your enemy instead of God as your friend. And all of us are born with that tendency. Even Samuel, who was a little priest in God's house, still did not know God's voice when he heard it. So it's not your fault, but there is something we can do about it. I've talked to people who have been through horrible things, and sometimes they blame themselves. Now, if you just say to somebody, oh, it's not your fault, none of that, there's nothing that you did that was wrong, that's not actually helpful, because you know what that means? If there's nothing they could have done about it, that means there's still nothing they can do about it from happening again. It can simultaneously not be your fault, because it's not because of what you wanted, but it is because of what you didn't know. So, then the solution becomes to gain knowledge. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, all right. So, I'll skip this one, but Cain has the same problem, becomes more concerned about himself and his body, and God points out something about him, and it's the main reason I put this one in here, it's in verse 6. When he saw Cain after this jealousy settled into his heart, look what God says. And the Lord said to Cain, why art thou wroth, or why are you you experiencing wrath? And why is your countenance what? Fallen. So some of you have experienced this before, but when somebody's intentions change, have you ever felt a shift in the room? You can just feel it. Like you're talking to somebody and then suddenly something in them kind of turns and then suddenly you're not sure if you can trust anything that's going on anymore. My dad told me about a situation where he was driving. He used to pick up hitchhikers uh, every once in a while and he was driving and he saw his friend, but he had this overwhelming sense, do not pick him up. And he didn't. And to this day, he's not sure why. Now, after doing a lot of research on this and talking to people about this, probably what happened is he saw something in his facial expression that said something is not right. Something happens when people make decisions in their minds, it shows up on their faces. And we don't know how to read it, but we can feel it. We can absolutely feel it. And this is exactly what God points out about Cain. So, What happens with Cain, of course, is he misidentifies the threat. He assumes that the threat is his brother, so he goes and kills his brother and thinks, okay, that'll solve the problem. But that's misidentifying the threat. So these corrupted instincts, they happen because of preservation of body over preservation of soul and not trusting that God is our friend. Children have mastered this. When they experience fear, they recognize that it's not just about running away from something. When your child, especially when they're small, when they're scared and they see something threatened, they don't just run randomly to a tree. Where do they run? If they have a good relationship there, where do they run? They run to their mom. They run to their dad. They don't just run away from, they run to. Adam ran away from, but he did not run to anything. I mean, he ran behind a tree. Okay, I think we're all there. So what's the solution for this first piece of uncorrupting the instincts? You can find this here in John chapter 14 and verse 26. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall do what? Teach you all things. Now, don't miss that. Because a lot of times the reason why we don't hear God's voice is because we've not learned what it sounds like. And so guess what the Holy Spirit does? He teaches you. He teaches you. Second point, discerning impressions. How do you tell the difference? 
We're going to first look at an example of, in the Bible, someone who actually did not follow those impressions, and we're going to look at an example for someone who did. A lot of times people are afraid of what will happen with strangers, but they found that like 80% of crimes that happen, um, ones of a, of a not good nature, of a violent nature, are actually done, are not done by strangers. 80% of violent crimes are actually be done by somebody you know. Um, this is not to make you suspicious of everybody that you're around, but it is to help you start to use some discerning, uh, use some discerning skills. Remember, Jesus was not betrayed by one of the priests. Who was he betrayed by? One of his disciples. Now, did he know it was coming? Oh, man, he talked about it all the way through. Like, for years, he's like, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is a devil. Like, it's, he, it never caught him by surprise. And you know why? Guess who was talking to him all the time? It was God. Like, he knew what was coming. Like, it wasn't so he was not caught by surprise. And when he finally submitted himself, it was because he submitted himself. But we have not learned that voice, and so oftentimes we get thrown into things unnecessarily until we learn to hear God's voice. So I'm going to give you a quick example. This one is with Doeg. Uh, who was one of Saul's servants, David, after uh, Saul is king but is told that he's no longer going to be king, he slays Goliath, and all of Israel loves David. And how does Saul feel about that? Everybody remember this story? Is he happy? He's like, yes, a champion in Israel. Absolutely not. He becomes horribly jealous of David, wants to kill him every chance that he gets. And so David's on the run. Now, David probably has some of these instinctive impressions just like what we read in Kelly's story. And he comes to the priest, and he's like, man, I'm hungry. I don't have a sword. I need some help. Verse 6, it says, so the priest gave him hollowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread. And it was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Look at verse 7. Now it says, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And his name was what? Doeg, an Edomite the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. Now, the author points this out for a reason, because guess who saw Doeg there? Well, David saw Doeg there. And if you see a guy who works for the guy that wants to kill you, do you think your alarm bells will be going off saying, hmm, I wonder if this guy has bad intentions? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. So you would be looking at that guy suspiciously, and you probably should, because he's one of David's herdsmen, and he's just hanging out there. Or Saul's herdman, sorry. Saul's herdman, and he's just hanging out there. That's a problem. But David ignores that, and then he begins to go down a path that leads to something unfortunate. And David said to Abimelech, Is there not a sword under thy hand or a spear? For I have not brought my sword. And listen to what he says. And no weapons with me because what? The king's business required haste. Now, do you, was David really trying to help Saul at this point? No, he's not. So then what will we call this? This is a lie. This is a lie. And so when his instincts tell him something is wrong, instead of trusting that God will get him through, he now begins to rely on his own human abilities, and he starts lying. Now, all of us have been here before. I remember I told someone my name is Jack, and it's not. None of you all surprised by that. Maybe the lie part. Verse 9. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest, is in the valley of Elah. Behold, it's wrapped. And so he gives David the sword. David's like, hey, there's nothing like this on earth. Now we fast forward there in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 22. And David said to Abiathar, now listen to this. I knew it that day. David was not surprised that this happened. He was disappointed that this happened, but he was not surprised. I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. And he says, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Every single person in the priest's household was killed. They actually killed everybody in the town. Only one person escaped because Saul was completely on a rage. And because David did not heed that impression, it cost the life of all these people. And David says so because that one signal that he wasn't paying attention to. Now, To be clear, is it really David's fault that Saul went and killed a whole bunch of people? No, it's not. Did he ask Saul to go out there and kill a bunch of people? Absolutely not. He obviously feels remorse about it. However, he learns from it because it tells him something that, hey, next time you feel that signal, listen. Listen. Now, I've heard people blame people for stuff like, um, you know, Jennifer showed me a page, you know, it was called like what she was wearing because people have used that as an excuse for why people get assaulted. And they showed everything 
from dresses and all these other things from people of all ages, and when you look through what they were wearing, you know that had absolutely nothing to do with why that happened. And I want to explain something to you. Nothing that anybody wears is going to cause me to do that. That's not the cause for why I do something like that. There has to be something going on that's very backwards inside my heart for me to do something like that. You follow that? Yes. And if somebody is wearing a gold watch, did they make you steal it? If someone has a nice car and they left their keys in there, did they make you drive it away? Nope. Absolutely not. That was your choice as the criminal. And that's what I'm saying. This is not your fault. Criminals are criminals, and they do what they do because they choose to. Now, are there things that we can do to make it harder on them? Sure. If David would have told the truth, would that make it harder on Saul? Yes. Does that make it his fault? No. All right, is everybody still following here? So discerning impressions. Let's see somebody who does it right. I love this one. This is with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is not a prophet. He's just a regular guy who has a special job, but he's just a regular dude. There's no indications that he was just getting prophetic messages from God. But listen to what he does when he feels impressions. Now it came to pass when Sambalot and Tobiah and Geshem and Abiram, these guys who were the enemies uh, the, and the rest of our enemies, heard that I builded the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at that time the wall was not set up or doors in the gates, that Sambalot, Geshem, sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of the villages of the plain. But they, what? They thought to do me mischief. How do you know that? Did they say, By the way, we want to do mischief? No. How did, what told them that they wanted to do mischief? Yeah, and a little bit of common sense, because what did it say about them? Who were they? Our enemies. Yeah, they probably don't have good intentions in mind. Like, their intentions toward, toward, uh, toward Nehemiah were not going to be good. And so he refused to go. And he sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? So he says no, but I want you to see how he does this. In verse 4 it says, Yet they sent on me four times after this sort, and I answered them how? After the same manner. And so you know what that meant? When he said no, he meant no. Don't change your no. If somebody is insisting on changing your no, they're also insisting on you not being in control of what happens next. Do not change your no. Unless you have like a good reason to. But don't change your no out of just pressure. Nehemiah stood his ground. And he said no. And no meant no. Amen. Amen. Stick to your word. Then Sambalat and his servant sent unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, and now he escalates it. Now he wants to threat. It is report, reported among the heathen and Gashmu that saith, The Jews think to rebel, which cause, uh, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach, the, uh, preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now... Shall it be reported to the king according to these words? Come now, therefore, and let us counsel together. Look, I'm just trying to look out for you. Everybody's spreading all these rumors about you. All these people are saying you're trying to make yourself king. They're trying to say you have prophets that are trying to speak on your behalf. Come on, man, look, I just want to help you out. Now, there's a, um, there's a, there's a, there's a word for this, um, or there's a phrase for this. It's called force teaming. And force teaming is when I start using we language, so that it makes it feel like I'm on your side. Like the guy that was going up the stairs, it's like, hey, we got to get those things upstairs. That's forced teaming. It's like, we? When did we become we? I'm me, you're you, and you're this weird guy, and, and like just hanging out at the bottom of the stairs. Like, oh, I'm... This isn't how I pick my friends. There's no we. And Nehemiah caught it. It's like, there ain't no we. I'm not going to go and sit down and have some little meeting with you because you think we're friends. We're not friends, man. Now, this does not mean that Christians are supposed to be mean to people, but I want you to understand that Jesus himself also drew boundaries when he knew people's intentions weren't good. You don't believe me? Well, let's take a look. Jesus would not commit himself unto all men. This is found in John chapter 2, 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name. And when they, uh, when they saw the miracles which he did, look, look at verse 24. But Jesus did not do what? Commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, I'm just going to read this verse a little bit differently. I'm going to tell you what it actually says, uh, what, how, it, all, all this, how, how this also can be read. 
So it says in verse 23, many believed in his name. In verse 24, when it says Jesus did not commit himself unto him, the word there did not commit himself is he did not believe them. It says they believed in him, but he did not believe them. Now, did Jesus hate these people? Absolutely not. He would die for them. But would he commit himself into their keeping? Absolutely not. Brothers and sisters, Christians are not forced to be deceived and manipulated by people. You do not owe it to somebody to just simply commit yourself into someone's keeping when you know that they are not trustworthy. Jesus would not commit himself to them because he didn't believe them. He knew they were just following him for miracles. They weren't actually interested in the message. They were just interested in the miracles. And so he said, no. And he stuck with it. All right. Third point, fear versus anxiety. Is everybody still doing all right? The Christian knows what to fear and what not to fear. Now, you all remember what happened with that woman when she followed the guy out? I want to show you a biblical story that has the exact same details, and you tell me if you can catch them. In Acts chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, Peter has been arrested by Herod. Herod is planning to kill him. He killed James, and so now he's going to kill Peter. And Peter doesn't care because he was doing God's work. So he's like, fine, I'm arrested, no big deal. I'm going to jail, no big deal. I might die, no big deal. He's not afraid because he's doing what God told him to do. But watch this. Now fear kind of comes into the picture, and I want you to see how this works. And when he had apprehended him, that is Herod, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quaternions, just soldiers, uh, to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people, that is, to kill him. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And now things are going to start getting interesting, because when you start praying, God starts talking. Let's see how this works. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door uh, kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly! And his chains fell off from his hands. Now, when he got smote on his side, when you get woken up out of sleep like that, what's that first feeling you fear? that you feel? <laughs> I kind of gave away the answer right there. What's that feeling you fear? Confusion. <laughs> I said the same thing twice. Yes, so you feel disoriented. You feel a little uh, out, of, out of whack, out of sorts. Something's just hit you. Like, all right, what's going on? You know, what just happened? Like, anybody heard the dish fall in the kitchen or something fall off the wall or something drop off the dryer, whatever that is? You immediately jump into action. And that's exactly the emotion the angel prompted for him. And that's not accidental. And so he raised him up on his side, saying, Arise up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Verse 8, And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So he's like getting dressed and like doing the best he can, like putting his sandals on. And he did so. And he said unto them, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. Now notice that. Because remember what she said. What she did is she just pulled all those blankets around herself and just bolted out the door. And the exact same thing is happening here where Peter's like, All right, put on my jacket. Let's go. <laughs> Hope you can hear the similarity. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by an angel, but thought he saw a vision. So just catch this. This whole time while he's going, he doesn't know what he's doing and why. He's just following this angel around. The angel's like, go this way. And it's like, all right, fine, I'm just going. He just, just follows him all over the place, has no clue what's going on. And sometimes that's the only way God can get us to listen is when we don't know what else to do other than just follow. Like I put the bench right there. I don't know why. I just did it and it made sense. The woman didn't know why she was doing that. She just did it. She didn't know why the door was supposed to be open, and Peter doesn't know why this is about to happen. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Remember what she said. She didn't know why these people's doors were unlocked. It's nighttime. Why did she know that their door was unlocked? And why that neighbor and not the next one over? Something just said go, and she just listened. And he went and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And check this out. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent this angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. It wasn't until he got all the way out and was standing right where he needed to be that he's like, Oh, God, just save me. Now, how much would you trust God after something like that? And how quickly would you listen to his voice next time you heard anything like that? Hmm. Jesus, courageously, these are his words when he was confronted with fear. The same day came out some of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out, the same character again, Herod, 
and depart thence, for Herod will kill thee. And listen to Jesus' response. And he said unto them, Go ye tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. And if you want to read between the lines there, he said, I don't care what Herod's up to. God has me on a mission, and I will be alive until it's over. You follow that? You don't need to be afraid unless God tells you it's time to move. But if God said to preach, that's exactly what you do, and you do so courageously. I'm pretty sure when, Fer- when Herod heard the word fox, it's the same thing that, you, that somebody else would hear if you accuse them of being a raccoon. People know what that means. That wasn't a compliment. But he wasn't afraid. So be strong and courageous. There was a situation with a woman who had taken her daughter to the theater, and it was all ladies that were going out, and they saw a guy standing in the shirt that said, uh, standing in the line that had a shirt on that said, afraid of the dark, and with a question mark on there, something about him felt wrong, and he caught her staring at him, and she said, oh, ladies night out, and she's like, ha yeah, but something didn't feel right. This ends well, so don't get worried. Like. But then the movie ends. They went to go see Jurassic Park and everything and they, you know, whatever movie they were seeing. And then when they left, they were some of the last people to leave. Her friend says, hey, you parked a couple blocks away. Why don't you let me give you a ride to your car? And she's like, okay, I can do that. But then her daughter said she had to go to the bathroom. She didn't want to leave her friend standing there. And she's like, you know what, we'll be fine. And as soon as her friend began to walk away, she felt this really weird sinking feeling. But she looked around, no one was there, especially not the weird t-shirt man. He was gone, and so she's like, okay, well, everything's probably gonna be fine. She begins to walk to the car with her daughter. And then sure enough, she gets that feeling again that someone's following me. And she looked behind her, and she saw that someone was. And she's like, okay, that's not good. And so she immediately made up in her mind that she was going to walk over to the car, and then she was going to open her daughter's door first, all instinct at this point, open her daughter's door first, put her in there, and she knew that by the time she tried to come back around, the guy would probably be there. And that's exactly what happened. So he's there, and she realizes, hmm, i got to get in the car. Daughter's in the back seat on the passenger side. She's on the passenger side. And she's like, well, I'm not going to try to wrestle with him because he's trying to open the door but she remembered to lock it first when she put her daughter in the car so he couldn't get in. And he knows that he's gonna bolt around, so she gets in the car, unlocks the door, jumps in, and tries to stick the keys in the ignition, but then she feels someone grabbing her legs, and she's like, oh goodness, this is not gonna go well. And she's like, well, I could try to stick them in the eye with my keys, but I don't wanna be somebody who sticks them in the eye with the keys. And then she realized, wait, I just did that. And she's like, shoot, well, at least I didn't stick them in both eyes. And she's like, wait a minute, yes, I did. And then she drives off, and then he's left on the ground doing what men do when they have keys stuck in their eyes. It's good to listen. (laughs) Here was the really cool part. As she drove off, her daughter says, Mom, you didn't buckle your (laughs) seatbelt. Now think about this. What does that comment tell you about how that girl feels? 100%. Her mom acted courageously, acted boldly, did exactly what she needed to do, and she knew she was safe with her mom. And so it is when you let God take the lead in your life. I'm not saying God will stick keys in people's eyes, but God will preserve, God will protect, God will be there for us. And if we ever have to suffer, it will only be for his name's sake. And even if we have to do that, we can do that with courage as well. Be courageous. Be strong and of good courage is what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, thy God, he it is that with thee that goeth with thee, and he shall not do what? Fail thee, nor forsake thee. God is with you. Jesus was no stranger to making sure people knew he was serious. When Judas came in with the band of soldiers, this is what happened. Jesus, knowing all things what would come upon him, he went forth, and he said unto them, Who are you looking for? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also which portrayed him stood with them. But look what happened in verse 6. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, what happened? They went backward and fell to the ground. Now, you can go try this right now when someone says, I'm looking for David, and I say, I am he. Do you think he's going to fall down? <laughs> Probably not. So if he fell down, what made him fall down? Uh, now, let me just see if you all can piece some things together. Why on earth would Jesus unleash that kind of power in that moment? Exactly. He let them know he meant business. Because what he says next, in verse 8, he says, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, what did he say next? Let these go their way. And did these men listen to them? They did. They did not touch the disciples. 
Because when Jesus said, I'm the man you're looking for, he made it real clear that you're not looking for anybody else. And the implication is, if my words knock you on your back, We serve a good God. Okay. There's just not time for everything else. Verse 28. This is coming from Matthew chapter 6. And he said, Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Wherefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. God knows you have need of these things. Verse 34, Take no thought for the morrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself, and sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. We are to seek first God and his kingdom. The primary use of fear is to protect the soul and not merely the body. This is why those who have faith in God can have courage. This story was relayed from 1854, and it says, in the spring of 1854, we visited Michigan again, and though we were obliged to ride over logways and through mud sloughs, my strength failed not. This is Ellen White and James White traveling. We felt that the Lord would have us visit Wisconsin and arrange to board the cars at Jackson last night. They have a call from God. They know they're going somewhere for a reason. But listen to what happens. And as we were preparing to take the train, we felt very solemn. Something just hit them, a sinking feeling. And so you know what they did when they felt that sinking feeling? They prayed. And the reason they prayed is because they learned that God will sometimes speak through your instincts. And when they felt that, they did not just ignore it. They prayed about it. And so they stopped and prayed, and it says, as we there committed ourselves to God, we could not refrain from weeping. And there's no explanation for this. They have no idea why they're crying, but they just feel something telling them something is about to happen. They went to the depot with feelings of deep solemnity. On boarding the train, we went into the forward car, which had seats with high backs, hoping that we might sleep some that night. They wanted the comfortable seats, but because they paused to pray, they could not get them. The car was full, and as we passed to the back into the next, and there found seats, I did not, as usual when traveling at night, lay off my bonnet, but held my carpet bag in my hand as if waiting for something. And she doesn't know why, but she's waiting as though something's about to happen. We both spoke of our singular feelings. Uh, We don't talk like that anymore, but they both were talking about those peculiar things that they were feeling in that moment. The train had run about three miles from Jackson when its motion became very violent, jerking backward and forward and finally stopping. I opened the window and saw one car uh, raised nearly up on one end, standing upright. And I heard agonizing groans and there was great confusion. The engine had been thrown from off the track, but the car that we were in was on the track and separated about 100 feet from the one in front of it. The coupling had not been broken. Something just detached it somehow and the car had been unfastened from the one before it, as if an angel had separated them. The baggage in the car was not much injured, and our large trunk of books was uninjured. The second class, or the second class car was crushed, and the pieces with the passengers were thrown on both sides of the track. The car which we had tried to get a seat in was much broken, and one end was raised up on a heap of ruins. Four were killed, some were mortally wounded, and many much, were much injured. We could not but feel that God had sent an angel to preserve our lives. Just like that. God is talking all the time. And we need to be able to listen to the voice of God. We need to be able to pray when we feel those impressions. But here are the promises of God. In Psalm 91 and verse 4, it says, He shall cover over thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. God would have us to trust him. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us so many instances and examples where we can understand that you are speaking to us. And we know, Lord, that you speak to us for our good always. Help us to learn to trust your voice. And I want to pray, Lord, for every soul that's been injured by our enemy. It is not their fault or ours, Lord, that someone has decided to do evil or that someone else has decided to take advantage. But, Lord, we pray for the Spirit of God to teach us to be able to hear your voice so that these things would not happen anymore. And I want to pray for healing, Lord, for every soul that's ever been hurt or touched by these kinds of events. Lord, that they would know that you are as much willing to prevent as you are willing to heal. And I pray that they would hear your voice softly speaking through them today. 
Lord, there are many other levels on which you speak to us, but I pray today that every person here would learn to listen to those impressions and those convictions that you give from on high. And ask for these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen.